So I'm going to be talking about rural community resilience, definitions, policies and implications. So I've introduced a wee subtitle there to give some focus. Uh, you'll see my Twitter handle there. So if you do want to tweet, that would be grand. Um, and we'll take it from there. So the outline of my presentation. So community resilience and rural community resilience. What does that actually mean from the literature? Looking at policy, the policy world as director of policy engagement, that's my bread and butter, so that will be quite a strong emphasis in my presentation. I'll also be asking who's being enabled by these um, enabling frameworks. It's not everyone, that's for sure. And then, so what? I'll be telling you a story. So what? What does this story matter? So community resilience. This term has become much more popular in research and particularly in national policies in Scotland and the UK more widely. It's seen as a key route towards sustainable rural development, and it's seen as a positive quality, and I'm going to come back to this uh, in a few moments, that communities should reach for. Um, it's seen as desirable and increasingly necessary, particularly with less public sector resources and greater national and international uncertainties. And I come from an island where we're facing Brexit on the 29th of March 2019. I said I wouldn't mention that, but I thought I'd get it out there. <laughs> so what is community resilience, looking at the literature? I've got three slides here that I'm going to go through very quickly. I do have a couple of publications which, if uh, people would like, I can uh, forward through, through Jim. So very quick canter. In summary, communities live in a context of disruptive change. This can be rapid, this can be slow burn. The literature says communities and individuals have varying degrees of control or agency over what happens in that context of change. Resilience is a process where positive human resources are balanced with their vulnerabilities. Human agency is key to this balancing act with people being able to imagine and dream and make deliberate choices for their individual or collective futures. The literature also says for community resilience, there are some general principles. Communities are able to learn, adapt, reorganise and change, create a positive direction of travel, able to bounce forward creatively, function in the midst of crisis, mobilise their resources at multiple levels and collaborate with relevant stakeholders, including those in the policy world. There are interlinked supporting factors, and these are capitals, socio-economic and cultural, resources, natural, the built environment, political capital, financial capital, connections between your place and people, locally and beyond, your values and your beliefs, your knowledge, your skills and your learning, your social networks being innovative, and you need leadership and you need community infrastructure and you need equitable and sustainable resource use. So for communities to be resilient, the literature says you need this whole mix of all of this. This that I've just gone through very quickly, this analysis hasn't just happened now. There's been a whole journey around the resilience narrative and again I can send the publications. Right from the 1970s, we have a focus on ecological systems and also in maths and physics, where the focus there is on bounce back. And that's the dominant narrative around resilience, is bouncing back from external shock. So if you hit something, a, a physical piece of metal, how will it bounce back? How will it reorganise to the same shape or a different shape? This is where the dominant field of resilience began in the 70s. We then move to social ecological systems. How do ecological systems respond to shock, to external impacts? And how do people integrate with those ecological systems to mitigate those shocks and to adapt? So when there's overfishing on the east coast of America and suddenly the, shock, the stocks decline, how do those rural communities adapt to suddenly having no fish to fish? How do they adapt? to that ecological system. And then we move over to the right-hand side to a whole host of people who started around 2010 
to say, well, hang on, people aren't passive in these systems. They are active. And that's where the human agency type of thinking starts to come in that I was just describing. That whole mix of assets, resources, ways of dreaming, of imagining futures, and organising yourself to reduce your vulnerabilities and build up your strengths. This is at this end of the spectrum. And the relationships between people are very, very important. And at the bottom here, we have something that I'm going to talk about in a moment. Resilience is not a neutral term. It's value-laden, and I shall come back to that. I'm going to hang that there as a taster that I'll come back to in a moment. So this is a journey that's taken from the 70s through to now, and it's continuing. So there isn't a total consensus on what resilience actually means. The journey continues. The definition that really sums up that right-hand end of the spectrum is here, and I'll give you a few seconds just to read that rather than me talk at the same time. So that's written by Magis in 2010, and she's a key writer and thinker. She's written in the forestry domain in particular and has carried out research in um, Oregon around this. And this is her summary, which I think really sums up that right-hand end of the spectrum. What we have to remember is that that's the right-hand end. Conventionally, resilience and community resilience focus on the use of bounce back from external shocks rather than this proactive human agency in a time of constant change. So the dominant use that you'll come across in uh, policy and in practice is communities as quite passive and bouncing back from external shocks rather than proactively changing their futures. We also have to remember that any human agency that is involved is unequally distributed. Not everybody has the same resources. Not everybody has the same opportunities. So let's, and that's a theme that you'll see coming through here. Within communities of place, which is the point of focus here, there are unequal and asymmetrical power relations. All of us will come from a place originally. Those of us researching communities, farming communities, wider rural communities, urban communities, know that those who are at the top of the tree and those further down, those who lead and those who follow. And we know that power is not distributed equally within communities. And as I've said, there are what in the literature are called normative associations with the word resilience. There are norms associated with resilience. What's normal, what's good about resilience, and what's bad about resilience. And there's a great writer called Kaplan who published in 1999, based on work that he did for several decades, looking at um, children, and this was in America, looking at children from very chaotic backgrounds and looking at why they were resilient. Because according to the stats, if you like, they shouldn't be. So what made them resilient? And he found that in the social services system, there were certain um, pushes and drives towards them becoming a certain type of people. And he wanted to unpack that and say, what is it about resilience? Why is resilience seen as a good thing? So he said, resilience, the word, has no meaning except in relationship to more or less desirable outcomes. It's defined either in terms of having approximated desirable outcomes, so have come close to desirable outcomes, or have distanced yourself from undesirable outcomes. So you've got close to what's desirable, or you've come further away from what's undesirable. And this is an absolutely crucial point when we look at resilience in the policy context. What are the desirable outcomes for rural communities? Desirable for who? And who decides what's desirable? And I'm going to try and address some of those questions. And my challenge to all of us is not to get carried away, therefore, with community resilience and resilience as simplistic terms, they're laden with value judgments. They come with that. And this leads to two significant emerging problems for us as analysts in this room. 
Those normative pressures exist in policy. Communities should be resilient, and I'll illustrate that. The second is there's a really lazy use around resilience in policy, and this is a focus on this reactive bounce back that I'm talking about, the dominant use of resilience rather than proactive human agency. And I'm going to just take you through in a few moments these two themes. So the normative pressures in policy. In Scotland we have, I don't expect you to read this, but you will get the slides, we have a national performance framework that's been around now for 11 years. And within that we have an outcome that says we have strong, resilient and supportive communities where people take responsibility for their own actions and how they affect others. That's an outcome that all policies in Scotland are aiming to deliver towards. The National Performance Framework was refreshed in 2018, and that outcome is still around living in communities that are inclusive, empowered, resilient, and safe. So that's our aim. The language is around resilient and empowered communities. When we look at Scottish Government strategies, year on year, this is the language that is used to describe communities already. So whenever communities are mentioned, whenever rural communities are mentioned, this is how they are described. Huge reservoir of talent, doing it for themselves, the right to influence decisions, they're leading change, they're strong, resilient and supportive, they live together in peace. There's cohesiveness, there's social justice, they deliver growth. They're enjoyable and sustainable places to live. How fantastic is that? Isn't that an amazing place to be and to live? Wouldn't you all love to live there? This idyll of communities, it's just great. What if you don't live somewhere like that? What if your experience of communities is not that? There's not really much place for you to fit here. So there's a normative pressure here to be this version of community within the policy language. And this this slide shows you the array of policies from the formation of the Scottish Parliament in 1999 through to 2021 that is focused on that rhetoric, that positive rhetoric around resilient, empowered communities around the social justice elements of that. And it's a very, very complex landscape. Here we have the Community Empowerment Act in 2015, the Islands Bill, which has just become an act that recognises the Scottish islands as somewhere special that needs special intervention. And we have land reform. These are specific recent examples. And that requires a heck of a lot of navigation And you need to be fairly empowered and resilient to be able to navigate that policy landscape. There's a great reliance and a growing reliance on resilient communities. So you need to be resilient already to engage in that type of policy landscape. So we see here communities that are building their own affordable homes, that are volunteering to deliver food out of the back of vans to those who can't get out and feed themselves. Resilient communities that have business parks, that have meeting places, that have primary industry and tourism, that have schools and are connected digitally. There's a reliance on resilient and empowered people. These are people I met when I was researching those who have bought their own land, who are community landowners. These are seen as resilient people heading up resilient community land buyouts. There's an increasing reliance on them. So that's part of the normative pressure on communities to be resilient, to be like these people. That's the aim, is to be like these people. The second thing we see in policy is a lazy use around resilience which fosters passive responses. And what I mean by that is that communities are encouraged to engage in pre-prescribed ways. And this is, in the literature, is called commissioning empowerment. It's a reaction to a service closure or the absence of a service, say broadband, but a service closure, 
Rural communities are then, quote, empowered to be more resilient by given the, by be given the opportunity to deliver the service. So that's empowerment, empowerment to deliver that health service or that social care service that might have been a state responsibility previously, but you're being empowered to deliver that yourself. It's not focused on wider rural community resilience, deciding where you want to go as a community, where you want to be in 2030. It's to deliver that service that has been pulled away. And in the literature, that's called ventriloquism. Communities become very good at saying back to the state, this is what you want, we'll deliver this for you. It might not be what they want as a community, but it's what's needed by the state. And a strong example that's coming through several times is around broadband and rural broadband. I came here 15 years ago to look at your broadband. Perhaps now that I'm back, it's all perfect. <laughs> In Scotland, we don't have universal broadband. And communities are digging their own trenches. And here's two examples in North Scotland and just north of Central Scotland. Here they're celebrated in the BBC News. Here they're a prize winner in the Scottish Rural Parliament that's happening right now. So they're being celebrated as these rural innovators digging their own trenches, getting their hands dirty, getting farmers to use their diggers to dig trenches. My question is, is that appropriate? Should a national infrastructure be provided by communities with their own hands? And what about those communities that don't have those resources to do that? Are they simply then left behind? So these are celebrated. What about those communities that can't draw together because they don't have the resources, they don't have the skills to work together, and they don't have the physical diggers to dig the trenches? What happens there? So it's more complex than it appears in the policy push. We need a reality check with rural communities. No individual or community starts from the same place, geographically, economically, or in terms of their health and well-being. And we see some photos from the top there. Those are the Northern Isles, the Orkney Isles, where access is by ferry or plane to get anywhere before you get onto the mainland of the islands and before you get onto the mainland of Scotland. Here we see part of the west coast of Scotland, a post-industrial landscape that is extremely economically depressed, totally different from the Northern Isles. And here we see a report in 2014 that we carried out on rural poverty, showing that although we are an oil-rich country, we have rural poverty. <coughs> And the next couple of slides, I'm going to talk about some work we did around mental ill health, which was motivated by a concern that the empowerment agenda, the resilience agenda, is not encompassing those who are experiencing mental ill health and therefore can't be part of all this range of policies that I showed you on an earlier slide. So I worked with a charity, national charity, Supporting Mind Scotland, to find out how people with mental ill health experience day-to-day -day life in rural Scotland. So it's based on their lived experience, and we gathered hundreds of responses from across Scotland. People right now, today, as we sit here in this room, are experiencing depression, suicidal thoughts and feelings, and self-harming behaviour, no matter their age, gender, or rural location. Their rural isolation is made worse by their remoteness, by stigma and fear. And the results showed that people want to connect in low-level ways, not in clinical ways, in non-clinical settings and locally. <coughs> How are these people able to engage with that policy agenda that I showed you, that map of multiple policies that are all around empowerment and resilience? Part of what's being done, funded by the Scottish Government, is a National Rural Mental Health Forum, which has grown in 18 months from 16 to 60 organisations that are working together across rural and mental health to improve practice, to reduce stigma, to raise awareness and to influence policy 
in order to bring people experiencing mental ill health into these frameworks, in order to raise a voice for those who are experiencing mental ill health across rural Scotland. So what we have to do is check who is becoming resilient when we're looking at community resilience in a policy context. There is diversity between and within communities. We need to question how can all communities be resilient in a way that's being increasingly demanded of them by policy, by funders and by service providers. How can all communities equally take advantage of community empowerment frameworks? And this picture is from um, an area north, a rural area north of Edinburgh. Again, a former industrial rural area. And why does this matter? This matters because we're seeing growing evidence of disempowerment in rural areas. We're seeing a new failure, like a market failure, a power redistribution failure. I've written back in 2010, eight years ago, about Darwinian development, which I'll come back to, where those who can use these empowerment frameworks are getting further ahead. The already empowered are being more empowered. And this now has social justice implications. We can see it in some leader programmes back home, where those who know how to use the system, apply for grants, speak the language, keep doing that. And as a result of that, they're able to apply for more grants. So those communities who can get further ahead, those who aren't involved, fall further behind. And we also see that national empowerment frameworks don't have the same resource put alongside them to support those who can't engage. They have guidance with a capital G, but no resource underpinning that or very limited resource underpinning that to ensure that the empowerment intention actually reaches those who aren't already empowered. And so new rural equalities are emerging. Service provision is more and more occurring through communities in health and social care, broadband and transport. And what we don't have is a systematic way of checking equalities of access. Who's checking for those off the radar? Who seeks out the invisible and the silent in these areas? Those who aren't figuring, who aren't on the radar, who are not empowered. We don't have systems for that. We're focusing on the resilience and empowerment rhetoric at the national outcomes level. There's some new evidence in the rural, in rural UK, so not only Scotland. I delivered um, a report called Recharging Rural, if you Google that. Um, and there's a link here on the slides when they're circulated. So this research was carried out from January to July 2018. The focus is on um, rural communities' perceptions of what's needed to ensure that they are resilient to 2030 and beyond. And the charity that commissioned this, the Prince's Countryside Fund, wanted to use this to direct their strategic investment. And we had over 3,000 responses across the UK. And here's showing you the distribution of those responses. And going very quickly through the headlines, we asked, what does remote rural mean to you? An open-ended question. How do you experience that? And a key finding is that it's not just where you live. It's not just your geographical place. It's a layering of that with personal factors, your socioeconomic circumstances, your mental and physical health. And what that means is that place labels alone are insufficient. People talked of disabling characteristics <coughs> living in rural areas, which combine to make their lives more challenging. The need for a car is number one from the 3,000 respondents. Infrastructure is limited or poor. Digital connectivity is poor. The roads are not fit for purpose for a thriving rural economy anymore. And links to ferries are challenging. Social isolation is being increased 
by limited absent or centralised services. And a key finding which I didn't anticipate, and having worked in this area for 30 plus years, it came as a surprise, is people talked about remoteness being a process that's happening to them. And through no change in their own behaviour, they can live in a village or a small town, and over the last 10 years, mm -hmm. things have changed around them such that they are now remote in a way that they weren't 10 years ago, through no change in their own behaviour. And that's significant. What about communities' own vision and actions? What are they doing to bring about change? A priority for them is keeping young people in rural areas in order to remain resilient as communities, involving them in decision-making, plus the mix of factors being around <coughs> housing, affordable housing, affordable transport, and meaningful jobs that have um, routes to progression. Maintaining and creating inclusive, diverse, open communities that connect people. And that was something that was really moving when I was doing the data analysis for this research, was the emphasis on inclusion and social inclusion in rural areas around the projects that they're pushing forward and really how people describe their own areas and what's a priority for them. And involving the private sector in that. Very often we look to the public sector to sort everything. <coughs> Many of them were talking about partnering with local businesses that are embedded in the rural communities. However, this number three comes back to what I've been talking about. But communities said, others must take action too. Communities can't do everything. Some of this is systemic. Some of this is national. Some of this is national infrastructure. We can't do everything. And a point that we tried to communicate very, very carefully is that people said if rural communities were a minority, if we were, we have a million rural people in Scotland, if we were all disabled, for example, if we were all in wheelchairs, you wouldn't be able to, um, you wouldn't be able to reduce our infrastructure in the way that you have. They weren't equating themselves to those experience, pre experiencing prejudice, but they were saying you couldn't, you couldn't treat us in this way. And the projects that came through 550 projects, again, <coughs> focused on bringing those in, the harder to reach, those experiencing isolation. That was the main focus of the projects. And their bigger vision about being resilient in 2030, there's a, a really strong desire to harness new opportunities, to be proactive, to be their own agents of change. But an absolute must is to have reliable, resilient, high-speed broadband and universal mobile coverage. Absolute given these days. And then they talked about a bright future of digital possibilities. Then we can be creative. We're already trying. We're already finding ways around the lack of this infrastructure. But if we were to have this, our creativity would know no bounds. We also need bigger system changes. When there's a reduction in closure of key services, surely there must be a point beyond which you don't go. So when it's the last post office or the last school or the last bank, stop, don't go any further. And the final point that came through from this piece of work was what's called a respect and listen agenda. There is so much knowledge, wisdom and experience in rural areas that the respondents felt is not being listened to, is not being taken account of. And that needs to be respected and built into policy. And that's diverse across the UK and surely is the case too here in rural Ireland. And this diversity of rural lived experience matters because what we have in Scotland and have had since <coughs> 1999 is a range of rural statements. And we have Rural Scotland, a new, new approach. We have this report, which is known as the Bluebell Report, because of all the bluebells on the cover. This is Rural Scotland, better still naturally. Speak Up for Rural Scotland was a report um, three years in the making from a rural development council, and then Scottish government responded. And here's a statement from 2000. And I doubt anyone would disagree with that, where everyone matters, every community, every family every rural Scot. But how do we make that happen so it genuinely is everyone? Here we see the same sorts of statements from our two cabinet secretaries for rural. 
for the benefit of everyone, for the benefit of Scotland as a whole, the collective benefit of people of Scotland. And we see this again in Programme for Government documents, which is the annual statement of what's going to happen in the year ahead in the Scottish, uh, from the Scottish Government and in the economic strategy. We see similar words around every, every person, every community. People are key to the economic and social well-being of Scotland's rural and island communities. Our core purpose is clear. We want all communities, both urban and rural, to flourish. <coughs> this is the high-level rhetoric. You saw the diagram with all the policies. How does that actually translate into reality? These are the policies for rural alone. Here's another example, courtesy of my colleagues Jane Atherton and Stephen Thompson. Again, how do people who are not already resilient and empowered navigate this landscape as well as the empowerment landscape? And outside rural, we have a whole range of other policies and programmes. We have community planning, we have... Um, local development strategy areas, we have city regions, what are called unfortunately non-city regions, they're not called rural but they're called non-city. Um, we have the Islands Act, that's the National Council of Rural Advisors producing an economic report um, and we have a national planning framework and um, other pieces of legislation and guidance as well as the planning bill currently going through the Parliament. So rural, as you very well know, touches all these other areas too and brings in all these other strands. So again, how do we navigate all of that? And how do those who are not already resilient and empowered do so? So I've told you a story. I've come over from Scotland, flew in yesterday, told you a story. So what? I believe this story has consequences and that there are social justice implications. Because we have enabling frameworks, and I've given you examples of a few. What we also have is this, and I think this is the best summary of Darwin's theory of evolution I've ever come across. We have long-necked giraffes. So these are the resi already resilient and empowered communities who are able to eat the leaves of these empowerment frameworks and these enabling frameworks. The short neck giraffes are not, and they end up dead. That's the theory of evolution. The long neck giraffes are busy digging trenches for their broadband, as one example. And there are many examples around health and social care. And this becomes a social justice issue. It's more than a theoretical interest. So who's responsible for addressing disempowerment and inequalities? Is it communities, policy makers, public sector service providers? Who will or should pick up that responsibility? Are we going to see increasing pressure on the third sector and on charities who traditionally address market failure to solve this new power redistribution failure? Are we going to see this normative pressure that Kaplan talks about for this person, it's typically drawn as a female, but as I saw yesterday out on farms and as uh, my research shows, and I'm sure yours does too, males are very much involved in this environment too. But this person has eight arms and he's doing multiple things, has steam coming out of their ears. And this was on the front of a report in the 80s, Inspiring Community Innovation. This was the front page of the report. This is what you should be like. This picture was to inspire. It would make me panic if that's what was expected of me. What are the long-term implications? There's a growing gap between these new haves and have-nots, I would argue. And I don't know who's checking the scale and distribution of that gap. Is that our job? What new disempowerment landscape will we see? especially with tighter public sector service budgets and ongoing pressure for community-led services. That's not going to go away. That's only going to increase. 
And how can social justice and social inclusion actually be delivered through community empowerment? What do you think? And what's our role as researchers? Do we continue to examine resilience and empowerment in unproblematic ways? Do we see them as theoretical concepts? Do we look at that spectrum and think, OK, I fit there, that's where I'm doing my bit of research? Or do we dig deeper, making sure we're rigorous in looking at the empowerment processes from multiple perspectives? What does that definition actually mean? How does it translate on the ground? What does it mean for people actually living daily out in rural areas? Do we remain dissatisfied until we've exhausted the evidence and saturated ourselves with triangulated data, with pulling in data from multiple points? Do we remain dissatisfied? And my conclusion, having worked in this for a while, is that we have a responsibility to make the invisible visible. And that's my challenge to all of us in the room. Because my conclusion is, my final slide, is that we in this room are privileged relatively. We have the time and resources to reflect. We therefore have a shared duty to build a more complete picture that shows the complex, non-linear, excluding nature of empowerment and resilience. People's realities are rich and diverse. We are complex. We're two-dimensional. If somebody was to tell me, you're this, you're that, or was to tell one of you, you're simply this, you would fight against that definition. Other individuals and communities are complex, so we have a responsibility to articulate that complexity as well. So we must choose to make that whole picture visible, quest for the invisible, and remain dissatisfied. Thank you.